All right, I want to turn it over to Jeff now, who's going to read from his book, and then we're going to do some question and answer. And let's hear it for Jeff. Wow, some this is this is my projecting. Yeah, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Well, hi everybody, and some familiar faces. Great to see after many years. Uh, my family and I moved away from D.C. back to my hometown of Boston um, eight and a half years ago. Um, but we spent 11 years here. My kids grew up here most of their lives. Where are they, Alice? Oh, okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll see them eventually. They're, 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 they're free-range kids, and they, they, they learned that first in, uh, in D.C. Um, but yeah, I had the great pleasure of serving on Stewart's Champions Council for probably half the time that I, that I lived here in D.C. Um, I still support the Coalition for Smarter Growth, even though I live in Boston now, <laughs> and I'm, I'm focused more on that region. Um, but uh, uh, I, I have, I'm, I'm armed with this book. And uh, Stewart had always said to me, if you're coming back, if you're passing through town, we'd love to do some sort of event. So I kept that in mind. Uh, but and we are passing through for a, a celebration from some friends of, with some friends of ours. Um, but I also have reason to be um, showing up at places and and promoting stuff because this book, Walkable City, uh, was just reissued in a 10th anniversary edition. Thus, the green we added it on a bike lane. You'll notice <laughs> on the side of the cover. Um, they wanted to do a whole new cover, and I, I love this cover so much. And um, so I just put a bike stripe down the, the side of it, and they, it, it took a little effort, but they, they uh, ultimately uh, agreed. Um, so I am kind of, you know, I'm, I'm on the book tour, I suppose. People don't really do book tours anymore unless you're, like, really famous and people show up just to see you, which doesn't really happen with me. Um, but uh, any opportunity I get to spread the word and do readings and that sort of thing, um, I try to do. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Phoenix, and I scheduled a similar event. I've only done a few of them at Cul-de-Sac. Have you guys heard of Cul-de-Sac? And uh, that was pretty awesome. It has no cul-de-sacs at Cul-de-Sac. And I could read to you about that, because uh, that's one of the things I write about I, I, in this new edition. So there's 100 new pages. Basically, a lot, of, a lot you, you may have been aware, a lot's happened in the last 10 years around the, the design of cities, the use of cities, uh, uh, people's lives in cities. There's a lot that we figured out. I think, I think two things happen. Cities changed and our experiences changed. And then also, there's a lot of stuff that had always been there that maybe some of us hadn't noticed as much as possible, as much as we should have. So for example, you know, we saw the housing crisis uh, arise. Well, let me interrupt myself to say that this book, grew out of, this book grew out of reading a whole bunch of other people's kind of one subject books. One subject books on cities and the environment on cities and, uh, uh, you know, epi epidemiologists talking about cities and health, on cities and the economy, on cities and sociability, on cities and parking, right? Donald Shoup's book. There are about 100 little books, not little books, 100 big books that I kind of squished into this book. And um, in the last 10 years, I read a bunch more books. And what I was starting to talk about was, um, you know, we're aware there's a housing crisis in terms of affordability and availability, but it wasn't until I read The Color of Law that many of you have probably read, um, that I realized, well, we, we neglected to talk about that in Suburban Nation. We n neglected to talk about it in the first edition of this book. So, so also there's a lot of new stuff that, that was learned that, that made it into this edition. And then I got a wonderful introduction by Jeanette Sadek Khan, who's a hero to many of us. And that's, that was a coup uh, to get her to participate in the book. So my first question, this is like uh, Picador. What, what is that uh, Monty Hall show? Not the Price is Right. Let's make a deal. You get to pick one of three doors. Um, I'm going to give you guys a choice as to what I read. But first, how many of you, and this is useful for me, how many of you read the first edition of Walkable City? This is the new edition. That's the first. OK. So a lot of hands went up. Too many hands for me to read. Hi, David. Too many hands for me to read um, from the first edition. So I'm only going to read the new stuff. So Stuart, I thought we'd have like a mic stand. This may be a little tricky, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Well, hold it for one second. Uh, I, I can do it. Um, I will be able to hold the mic in a minute once I get to a page. But my question is, uh, there's a lot of things I like talking about. Here are some of your choices from the new, from the new stuff. 
I could talk about COVID and its impact on cities. I could talk about, I have a really good rant um, against Uber and Lyft. And I have, a, who, by the way, got, got us here tonight. Um, I, I have a, a, a rant and warning about autonomous vehicles. That's a lot of fun. Uh, oh, okay, wow, wow. Um, I could talk about the color of law, but probably this crowd, you've already read that book already. Um, I could talk about bicycles. I could talk about climate. You guys know all the bike stuff already. But, um, should, well, I didn't hear any chance. I, I mean, there was a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles. Do you guys also want to hear about Uber and Lyft? All right. This is really, get a picture of this. This is super cool. So, um, I got to find it now. Oh, that's good. That's good, too. Can I also read you about Elon Musk? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to read. Yeah. So this is called, so you guys all know about, let, let me hear, let me hear who here understands induced demand. Okay. New CSG fact sheet coming out next week. So, um, so I, I, I have, all new information, of course, not repeating the induced demand conversation, but just there's new things we learned. Um, but that kind of slides in. Oh, and, and the, the, the story of the Alaska Way in Seattle, which you may remember is in the earlier edition. And then, of course, well, what happened? Well, they did exactly what they weren't supposed to do and everything that we predicted happened and all that. Um, but this, the, the, this kind of segues into more tunnels, this time for suckers. So the, the, previous, the previous was the was Big Bertha, you know, digging in... Uh, Seattle. More tunnels this time for suckers. Intrepid curbed reporter Alyssa Walker dropped in on the Las Vegas dropped in on Las Vegas during the annual consumer electronics show where lidar where a lidar manufacturer was demonstrating how their cars stop for child pedestrian dummies in crosswalks while autonomous Teslas routinely plow through them. She took a deep dive underground to check out the two tunnels that Elon Musk's boring company had dug beneath the convention center to spare visitors a 20 minute walk. What she found was two crawling queues of drivers getting, quote, stuck in seemingly ordinary traffic, except they're trapped inside what looks to be the world's long longest MRI machine. <laughs> the city of Las Vegas paid Musk $50 million for a contraption that was promised to move 4,000 people per hour. What it got was a flashy casino sideshow that currently moves about 1,300 people per hour, roughly the capacity of any two-lane road in Nevada. The Boring Company made its promise to the city in 2019 with the expectation that the tunnels would be stocked not with ordinary Teslas, but with, quote, high passenger urban density transport. That's tech bro speak for 12-seat vans. In 2020, Musk said that the vans, quote, should be ready for unveiling next year. His follow-up in 2021, quote, I think Tesla is definitely going to make an electric van at some point. Will the vans ever materialize? When they do, the transportation press will no doubt lavish universal praise on Musk for inventing what turns out to be an exceptionally low-capacity subway. In the meantime, San Bernardino County, Fort Lauderdale, and other municipalities are lining up for more Tesla tunnels. The Florida proposal, 2.7 miles of what is hoped will be a much larger network, is championed by Mayor Dean Trentalis as a potential solution to downtown gridlock. And if you buy that, there is some slightly moist land in the Everglades I would like to show you. For people who understand the dynamics of urban traffic, it is frustrating to see Musk, who is clearly smart about some things, get so close. By the way, that was before he bought Twitter. <laughs> um, it's frustrating to see Musk get so close to the hoop and repeatedly flub the layup. He has helped develop a technology that purportedly reduces the cost of building a tunnel from one billion to 10 million a mile. But instead of creating subways at a fraction of the cost, he is effectively just supplementing existing above ground roads at five times the cost and inducing more driving the whole time. Not a surprising idea from a car maker. So that was, uh, that we, it moves right into Uberus and Nemesis. <laughs> On, oh, thank you, wow, a smattering. I was at the symphony last night and they knew not to clap between the movements, but thank you. <laughs> In October of 2017, I was invited to give a lecture at Uber's San Francisco headquarters. St you know, I'm going to read this. I'm not going to read autonomous vehicles yet. 
and then Stuart and I will talk a little bit, and then if there's interest in time, we'll, we'll do that. But I like to keep it, keep it moving, right? So. In October of 2017, I was invited to give a lecture at Uber's San Francisco headquarters. Staff there had read my books and were curious what I might have to say about the intersection of ride hailing and the walkable city. I think they expected some good news. Certainly, their company's stated objective of ending private car ownership was well in keeping with my vision of less car-dependent communities. Personally, I was driving a lot less due to Uber, well, Lyft actually, less toxic CEO, and their advocacy for public transit was admirable. I did my best to put together an objective talk. And now we'll pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> By the way, one thing I do want to say, and you see it in the reviews of Jeff's book, there is no clearer writer than, and that, that you will find, and it's a great way to learn great planning concepts as a, almost reading a, like a novel. It's wonderful. I have to turn the page, so I'm being, having the mic held. Um, unfortunately for them, Uber, my research included speaking to Alejandro Hanau, a recent University of Colorado Denver graduate, thank you, who had worked as an Uber and Lyft driver while earning his PhD in civil engineering, as well as a solid five-star rating. He had tracked his miles, polled his customers, and collected a ton of data that did not exactly comply with the dominant ride-hailing narrative. First off, he found that for every 10 miles he drove his customer, his car had to move 16.9 miles thanks to deadheading between rides. Well, if the goal is to reduce driving, that's a bad start. He also found that 45% of his customers, far from leaving the car at home, had opted into ride hailing rather than taking transit, walking, biking, or simply not traveling. Strike two, finally he had observed that people seem to be using ride hailing as a path toward Car ownership, driving for Uber and Lyft was enabling them to buy cars they otherwise couldn't afford. Yikes. The initial theory be behind ride hailing was that by making most of the costs of driving variable rather than fixed, people would ditch their cars and drive less. The exact opposite seemed to be happening. Car ownership was not dropping, and between deadheading and customers stolen from other modes, each Uber and Lyft ride represented more than a tripling of automotive vehicles travel. Tripling, that's surprising, so let's do the math together. If 100 people take Uber a mile, that causes 169 miles of driving. But 45 of those people without Uber would not have driven at all. 169 divided by the remaining 55 is more than three. More recent data would adjust this number closer to four. That's what I learned from Alejandro. I had also become painfully aware of how representatives from the car lobby were using the promise of Uber and Lyft to kill transit funding with success. As Henry Grabar reported in State, cities in Slate, cities across the country are cutting public transportation because they think ride hailing services will fill the gap. And the early data, later confirmed, suggested that public riding, public transit ridership was dropping noticeably wherever ride hailing entered a market. I had also come across a billboard ad that casts some doubt on Uber and Lyft's much trumpeted partnership with transit. It showed a forlorn looking waif staring in frustration down an empty subway tunnel with the caption, you can't miss an Uber. By the way, Uber's real feelings on this matter were made clear during their 2019 IPO filing when they described their TAM, total addressable market, as including quote, all public transportation miles in all countries globally. Then there was the traffic data. Unsurprising for a service that was tripling vehicle miles traveled with every ride, traffic congestion in uber-rich cities was through the roof. In Uber's hometown, a study found that trip times had risen 31% exclusively due to ride hailing. In early 2017, nearly two-thirds of congestion-related moving violations in downtown San Francisco were being committed by Uber and Lyft drivers. Finally, there was my own experience watching every single lift I ever hailed waiting for me smack dab in the middle of the bike lane, even when ample curb parking was available five feet away. I asked the drivers if they had received a single word of instruction from HQ on bike safety. The answer was no. And you know, I've, I have to say I'm not the best person to pick up as an Uber or Lyft driver because I'm very curious about why they park in the bike lanes. All in all, ride hailing was shaping up to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad idea. The first slide of my presentation showed Batman standing menacingly behind the seated Joker in an inter interrogation chamber. Thanks for inviting me, it said. 
I suspect we both thought of the other party as the joker. <laughs> it was actually a cordial event, mostly because all of the Uber employees I, I met seemed pretty convinced they were saving the planet. I took their earnestness to heart and asked them seriously, what is the value proposition for cities? I reminded them how cars, a dispersal tool, and cities, a concentration tool, work at cross purposes. I showed them Hanau's data. I asked them about the billboard. I reviewed the defense they had published. I reviewed the defense they had published about ride hailing's compatibility with transit. I presented my conclusions in two large print all text slides. I don't understand the defense and I don't see the value proposition for cities. Like many VC funded Silicon startups, Uber's model was to quote, move fast and break things. As related by Sarah Goodyear and the war on cars, woo, do you guys listen to the war on cars? Incredible show, yeah. As related by Sarah Goodyear and the war of cars, Uber did both move fast and broke things. In half a decade, they broke yellow taxis, sending immigrant cab owners leaping into the East River. They broke transit, causing an average 9% drop in ridership. They broke labor rights. They will eventually break their investors, having never turned to profit and having no visible path to profitability. Uber lost 6.8 billion in 2020. Lyft, being smaller, lost a mere 4.4 billion. <laughs> About a year after my visit, Uber got back in touch. Having ditched their pedestrian-killing autonomous vehicle division, they were now betting on flying taxis. Would I be willing to speak, would I be willing to speak at the Uber Elevate Summit in Los Angeles? Sure, I said, as long as they were comfortable with me telling the audience that Uber Air, as they had conceived it, was a terrible idea for cities, but not to worry because it would never happen. <laughs> they declined my offer. Uber sold off Elevate in 2020 for a huge loss. It's hard to see how there is any future for these companies behind a return to their initial conception, which was to give a rich dude named Garrett Camp a premium ride to the nightclub. Our cities will recover, but the Uber experience should not be forgotten, especially as we turn our attention to autonomous vehicles. Ooh, shiny is no way to run a town. Thank you, now you can clap. So one of the things I wanted to ask Jeff, he hasn't had a chance to tour around his uh, old city here, but he spent time in Boston, is how do you think D.C., Boston, American cities have done when they had this opportunity in this terrible pandemic to remake themselves? How have we done? How would you grade us? Well, I'm the wrong, I'm, I'm the wrong person to, g to give a grade. I would <laughs> say that, um, that in the intro to the book, Jeanette Sadiq Khan talks quite poetically, as you may have seen her do on CNN and other uh, quite prominent venues, um, and as Mayor Hidalgo in Paris did during the pandemic, and I remember seeing Jeanette on CNN during the pandemic, basically saying, you know, what I didn't have the nerve to say, which is, if you remember Anne Hidalgo, you know, we can hear the birds, we can breathe the air, life is good again, this is how cities should be, and Jeanette basically said the same thing, which is, um, let's not be focused so much on the pandemic. Let's, let's recognize that these changes we've made temporarily to our cities are the changes that we should be making no matter what. And of course, you know, all of our cities made a lot of changes and then half changed them back. I don't know. Um, there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful slide I have. It's from the front of the Boston Globe. And you know, Hanover Street, which is the heart of the North End, which is Little Italy in Boston, uh, was pedestrianized. And, it sh and, and some of the neighbors were complaining about, I guess, noise and uh, maybe some, a little bit of trash in the street and that sort of thing. And it shows like dozens of people, 100 people out in the street dining and just having the most del uh, delightful time. And the headline says, uh, neighbors concerned about Hanover Street nightmare. <laughs> 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 but, but, but interestingly, and I do talk about this in the book, I had a very, I had a more cautious approach than Jeanette Sadiq Khan, and I, uh, the, the Boston was having a hard time, the Boston City Council, cer certain progressives on City Council, like someone you may have heard of named Michelle Wu, uh, who's now our amazing mayor, um, they were trying to get the, the current mayor to uh, make these COVID safe street changes to turn driving lanes into, you know, wider sidewalks. In my town, Brookline, which is next to Boston, 
we actually took Beacon Street, which is four lanes, we made it two lanes, and the parking lane became that driving lane, and then the, par what, what, sorry, this, the, the extra driving lanes became parking lanes, and where the cars were parked became double sidewalks. It was great, of course, it's been switched back like, like so many things. But Mayor Wu was trying to get um, our then mayor, what was his name, Menino? Walsh, Mayor Marty Walsh, who was just stepped down as Labor Secretary um, for Biden, to make changes. So they had a special council hearing uh, on these issues, and I got to kick it off with a talk about why this was important. And my whole spiel was, and this is early in the pandemic, right? Six feet, keep six feet away from everyone, and of course these sidewalks are crowded. And I, and I said, you know, the, the pandemic is a spatial crisis that has a spatial cure, and we need to make these changes for the reason of the pandemic and the pandemic alone, which were, were, was, was effective. By the time the council hearing was, um, was called, the mayor was ready. The, the, he knew he was gonna get in trouble, so he was ready to respond to it immediately with the changes that Boston then made. But my point is, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. I was using the pandemic as the excuse for these changes, uh, and then when the, when the pandemic ended or became less of an issue, um, it's hard to fight for keeping them. So I, I, I wish I had taken more of a Jeanette Sadek Khan and, and uh, um, Mayor Hidalgo approach. But how's, I mean, you know, I thought you were just gonna ask me to compare Boston and DC. It's remarkable, because um, we lived in DC during the decade when it really became bikeable. And I was back here, and I bike around Boston. The thing about Boston, it has a lot of great places to bike, but inevitably in the middle of them, there's a place where you will die. <laughs> so, you know, between the Greenway and the Riverway, you're, you're on, you know, Com Ave at the BU Bridge. You know, there's always some interruption. Uh, I came back here this past summer just to, um, I forget why, because I could, and, um, and I had the most brilliant two days on City Bike, remi being reminded just how incredibly bikeable this city is. I mean, it's always Yay. been, it's, you know, um, it's always been a very walkable city. Um, and I'm so sorry, I, did you tell the crowd about your, your I collision? I did, I told okay. them about my experience. As, honestly, obviously what I had was very minor to, compared to what people have been going through and really serious injuries and deaths. It was, but it, and you know, it's hard to have, you know, you, we all are empathetic and want to be empathetic, but until you've had that experience, you don't really appreciate it. Yeah. So like Mike Doyle, who founded Families for Safe Streets in Alexandria, got hit and I think had some pretty serious injuries and, you know, he's on the war path now, I mean, or appropriately, but it is, you know, I, I can't imagine, and this was on a, you know, nice slow Alexandria street on a turn in a crosswalk. I can't imagine a Ford F-150 doing 40 miles an hour on Route 1 where you're trying to cross. And, I mean, yeah. you show how the so death rates are so high. This is something else, of course, I talk about in the book. There's been an 82% increase in pedestrian deaths since 2009, 82%. And that's something, yeah, right of way by Angie, hold it up. Uh, right of way by, you've, the cover is covered, but right of way by Angie Schmidt is a really important book on this, and it's one of the ones I read that helped to shape, shape what I put in the book. Um, she's a little bit, I wouldn't say timid, but she doesn't argue as um, perhaps emphatically as I would about the causes. Um, she talks about the suburbanization of poverty, which is a very important um, factor. A lot of people now in America are living in places that were never, living without cars in places that were never meant to be lived in without cars because the poor people have ended up living in where they, you know, they have no choice but to live in these unwalkable places. The biggest factor for sure though is SUVs and, and small trucks. And not only that, the, the, basically it's been the uptake of SUVs that is principally responsible. It's not cell phones, they've got cell phones in Europe and their death rates keep declining. But ours have been going up with the adoption of SUVs. And there's one other factor which I had an editorial three weeks ago in The Hill specifically about, which is that um, you know, American engineers, and by the way, uh, Chuck Marone's book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, super important, um, also quoted in mine. Uh, American engineers, and I've had this done to me um, on many projects, you know, the standard in America is if you want people going 20 miles an hour on a street, then you mark the street for 20 and you engineer it for 30. Like, that's the American standard because we are crazy. <laughs> and if I, if I can editorialize for a second, you know, I just learned, like, two, two months ago, because Jane Jacobs talks about when 
they graduate students with degrees in traffic engineering, how they're perpetrating a fraud upon the students and upon American society. But in fact, students don't graduate in traffic engineering. If you're a traffic engineer, you've, you, you've got a degree in civil engineering, and you've, you're lucky if you've taken one course in traffic engineering, and in that course, you're lucky if you took one class in traffic safety, and in that one class, you inevitably talked about highway safety. And of course, highway safety is the foundation of traffic safety in the US, which points us exactly in the wrong direction. Because on a highway, you're, well, first of all, the, when pedestrians and cyclists are, are around, and drivers, the most important aspect, the most important um, feature of any crash is speed, right? And on a highway, the speed is fairly constant. If you're like me, you get on the highway, you look for the speed limit, you set your cruise control at nine miles an hour over the speed limit, right? <laughs> so if that's the way that people determine their speed on highways, then anything you can do to remove friction, to make it forgiving, to remove potential for conflict makes it safer. So wider lanes, more lanes, one-way travel, no intersections, big swooping curves, no trees, clear zones, and Chuck Marone talks about this brilliantly. Of course, in downtown, it's the exact opposite. Anywhere where there are people around, houses, shops, anything else, your speed is determined by the environment. So all these techniques that the engineers learned in their one class, their one day, during that one class they took, uh, supposedly learning enough to be traffic engineers, is teaching them the opposite of actually what makes our neighborhoods safe. And that's the biggest struggle we face as planners when we go into communities is to make the engineers understand. And of course, if you're engineers in the crowd, I learned all this from engineers, so it's not engineers I have a problem with, it's just like almost every engineer that I have a problem with. <laughs> but there's a lot of really progressive great engineers who are helping us to push back. Um, my editorial on the Hill basically said, when can we sue? Because we, we, need, we need to change the standards, the MUTCD, the Manual for Uniform uh, Traffic Controls uh, devices, um, the, the, uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely, in every way, both protected from liability by following bad standards, and then engineers who want to pl make places safer can't because it's against the, s the standards. So it's, it's a huge struggle that we face, but that's also, I think, been a key factor in why uh, pedestrian and cyclist deaths continue to decline in Europe and they continue to skyrocket here in the US. Do we have any transportation engineers who happen to also be attorneys in this room? Yeah. <laughs> See me after. So I was gonna, I was gonna ask poor Sonia and I are beating our heads against the wall in Fairfax County with VDOT and trying to tame these arterials. A lot of people walking, immigrant community, Bailey's Crossroads, and they have pulled out every delay tactic in the book. Yet, I think um, when one guy from his condo was filming uh, a weavi dangerous weaving on 395, they fixed that within a day when it became embarrassing in the media. Within a day, they had fixed a major interstate safety issue. But it's been months since we started this campaign with a hundred and some people, Spanish-speaking residents, and their kids testifying and still no change. So any luck with suburban arterials? Yeah. <laughs> No, I think, I think the, um, you know, I focus in my work on, on for, be, for want of a better term, I don't use this term, but for, for want of a better term, like deep walkability. I'm trying to make places where people will make the choice to walk. And so I don't spend too much time in the suburbs because, in fact, um, the, other, the other things that make a walk happen when you're not desperate, you know, the, the, the walk being useful, the walk being comfortable, and the walk being interesting, those often aren't there. So creating pedestrians by choice in the suburbs is very difficult. So I don't spend much time there because I'm trying to create, most of my clients understand that I'm trying to create the whole package. However, rule 98, I think, in walkable city rules, maybe it's 99, I don't, it says don't give up on sprawl. And it asks the question, what can we do in these suburban places where A, so many people live and a lot of, a lot of poor people live, and B, the, there's so many deaths and injuries uh, happening. Um, and we really focus, we focus on crosswalks. <laughs> I mean, it's dumb stuff. Like, they don't bring us in to tell them that they need a better crosswalk. But, but or I should say that, that, you know, people don't hire me to tell them, oh, this intersection has only three legs of a crosswalk, and you're not meeting your ADA requirements, right? That's not, that's, that's you know, either below or above my pay grade. But, but um, <coughs> because walking along these streets typically is so unpleasant, 
um, we generally just lo we look at the details of the intersection and what can be done, um, particularly around right turns and left turns and other things to make the intersection safer. So returning one, one more thing for Jeff and then we'll ask if you guys have some questions. Returning to our city, our downtown is in deep trouble. The commercial office market collapsed. It's a heavy telecommuting city. Yet I have some business allies who are up in arms that there would be another protected bike lane or protected bus lane because they're getting pressure from their suburban members who want to be able to get in town fast and out. They want their employees to come back in, so they want to make it easier for them to drive. It feels like, like we're going back to the, to the past with this. If you were called before the Board of Trade and the Federal City Council here in Washington and you were just given the D.C. downtown assignment, what would you tell them? Well, I didn't realize it was in trouble. Is it truly in trouble? It is. I think there's a lot of empty office yeah. buildings and probably more than just about anywhere else in the country because of the 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 office work workforce. Well, I think you know I I, I would especially because I know so little. Uh, I would keep it keep it upper level, keep it high level. the The simple fact is that that these days now that workforces are so mobile, particularly now with Zoom, workers are so mobile. Um, the, the, the proper economic development strategy is to be a place where people want to be. So what are the factors that make your downtown uh, attractive as a destination, as a uh, quality of life for the worker that's higher than being out in, you know, we were out in uh, Chantilly today <laughs> near Dulles, uh, where, you know, you're, you've got a choice of a chain store or a brown bag for lunch. Clearly, in downtown D.C., that's not the story. I, I think, you know, it's those aspects of the city that make it different from the suburbs that make it competitive against the suburbs. You know, in a competitive market, the differentiated product commands a price premium. So DC has to keep being DC, and, and anything that makes it more walkable and bikeable is distinguishing it from the, the conventional surroundings. All right, I'll get Cheryl to call Mayor Bowser and get you hired here. We want you. Any questions? We've got time for a couple of questions. Over here first. Yes. Oh, let me bring you the mic. Sure. Okay. Hi, my name is Justine, and I'm from Falls Church, Virginia. Um, you talk about how a walk should be interesting. Um, no large blank walls or dark enclaves. How far do you think towns and cities can go or should go to dictate aesthetic standards that are also keep things affordable? How do you how do you manage that? And then. Are there any places that actually do this well? So I'm aware of active facade guidelines in places like Sydney and Stockholm. I don't know an American city that has an active facade guideline. I, I certainly put them in the plans. Like when I do, most of the plans I do are for, um, well, I do two types of plans. Typically I'm doing a plan for a city and then it's focused on streets because they want to be as walkable as quickly as possible. And so we're basically restriping and redirecting streets to make that happen, but we're not focusing so much on buildings. Or I do projects, and when I say I, I, I could be talking about a dozen people and firms who also do what I do. Um, when we're doing projects for developers, that's when we focus more on buildings. That's when we can write our own little overlay zoning codes that just apply to our site, right? Almost like a homeowner's uh, document. Uh, and in those cases, we insist on demise lines, where we take, a, if a building is more than, say, 200 feet long, it has to look like more than one building. We break it and, and assign it to different architects. Um, you can do something very simple. To, 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 to answer your question a bit, I think it's very dangerous and probably counterproductive to providing housing to having um, review panels that are aesthetically judging the quality of individual projects that are submitted. I would love to see that happening in Brookline where I live, but uh, because some real dogs have been built recently, I mentioned that on Twitter about one building and I had my hat handed to me um, very quickly. Um, but the, 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 the simple answer is, for example, you can make basic rules like uh, you must have one opening for every 10 feet of wall, or you may not have the same facade repeated for more than 200 feet, or simple rules like that that aren't open to interpretation, right? And, and that's how the, and Jan Gale in his books talks about active facade policies in, in Europe, that's what he's referring to, a more ver vertical and horizontal articulation. 
but things that have to be uh, easily dis discernible by a, by a staff member and not a uh, elected committee because then you're delaying anything that's being built. But it's very easy to say no blank walls or no parking structure may be up against a public street unless at ground level it has a different use and at upper level it's articulated like something that's inhabited, right? So there's simple rules like that. So I, I'm all for rules. You know, I don't write, I never write guidelines, I write requirements so that staff can handle it and not, not committees. Uh, this, yeah? Thanks, Stuart. Um, hi, Jeff. Hi, Rachel. I love you. <laughs> you want to talk to my wife over here? <laughs> or you could talk to my husband. He's right next to me. Um, oh, I see how this but goes. But I'm also yeah. mad at you okay. because, um, all right, so we're trying to find a new uh, DOT director for our county. I mean, this is huge. Which county? Fairfax. 1.2 okay. million people. We are bigger than eight states in the country and, the, and D.C., all right, so it's, it's really big, 400 square miles. And I, I am not getting people like you applying for the job. So if there are not people like you in the game, in government, we, I mean, this is our problem. I am taking on VDOT. It's like taking on the Pentagon. And so this, and I got Stuart, I got Sonia, I got all these people here. But if I don't get people like you in government, this is not going to change because they're not i invited like five of them tonight they're not here i asked them to read your book some of them do maybe not and they get the theory but we got to get down to brass tacks here i mean this is really serious we had the highest pedestrian rate in fairfax last year like you said death and, rate and this is a problem um, what did i say highest pedestrian death rate yes pe yeah. in, in the region you mean no in fairfax oh so Fairfax has the highest pedestrian death rate in, or you're saying it's, year, you're so, oh, you, so you, hit a, you hit a record, you hit your own record. Okay. In Fairfax, yes. Yeah. And a lot of it was because we've over-designed <coughs> these streets. They're way too wide, yep. way too fast. And the idea, and you know Ian Lockwood, and I'm, you know, big, and it's about throughput. How do we yep. reward the through traveler and not the local traveler? And if we can just change that formula and the LOS, we're trying to, Get rid of, and you know what LOS stands for? Level of, uh, wait, uh, lack of success. <laughs> no, no, le yeah, level of stupidity. Yeah. No, I, I actually, so, yeah, I, I, uh, I like that. Good. I think in one of my books I say level of service should be just called lack of success, because if, if you have a C or better on your main street, you have a, a failed main street. But I, I, I'm thinking that wasn't a question, so I don't need to answer it. Um, how, however, um, you know, if I can be optimistic, not necessarily about Fairfax, but the, the wonderful experience I have, having reached this age and been doing this for 30 years, is that um, almost everyone in the planning departments at least gets it. And the, the experience I have, and don't too loudly disagree with me here, but the experience I have compared to even 10 years ago is that we used to have to, to fight staff, and often government officials, not not engineers, not, not public works, not, in, not, not traffic officials, but public officials in leadership and public officials in planning, um, as recently as 10 years ago, were often impediments, and now they're mostly allies. And I have to say, it's because a lot of them are younger. And, and it's, it's wonderful, actually, to show up in cities and people were educated on the stuff that, that we put out 20 years ago. That's great, suburban nation and all of that. Um, so I do, think, I do think things are getting better. However, in terms of engineers and engineering, I do think drastic measures are needed, and I actually think some sort of class action lawsuit is a, is a good approach. Rachel did actually bring her own attorney with her, but I don't think it's his specialty, so. <laughs> All right, I've, I've got to go here. Okay. Hi, I'm Jesse, urban planning graduate student at University of Maryland. Um, my question is, it seems like a lot of people still move to the suburbs when they start having kids um, because they think people need a yard and things like that. How can denser areas compete for those people who think they still need to move out to the suburbs? So in my experience, there are a lot of um, confused people who think that having a big yard and no good local parks is a better lifestyle, right? Um, but 
to be more, um, uh, I think, accurate, it's because of schools. So there are certain folks who will choose the more rural or the more suburban choice because they want that. They're, they're not the people I like to hang out with, but that's a, probably half the population. But there's a lot of people who will move to the suburbs when they have kids because everyone wants what's best for their kids. And if the schools are better uh, five miles away, they're going to move five miles away. It's that simple. Um, that is unfortunate. That's a social, societal problem that we face. Um, it's bigger than the sort of thing that I could think about fixing. But I always like to point out, that's a, that's a small slice of your life. Like from having, having kids in school is, what, a sixth of your life? I haven't done the math. But it's, there's a ton of time before your kids are in school and a ton of time after your kids are in school where school, school quality is not going to be the determining factor in where you live. And that provides ample people to give life to and enjoy uh, more urban areas. Okay, one, yeah. one last question. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Jeff, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm Judith Fogel, and I realize we are very Virginia um, focused right now because I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. I happen to be communications chair for Take a Deep Breath, the Alexandria Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, this is really more of a personal question. So I live in Alexandria, and as you know, uh, the lower 100 block of King Street uh, closed to vehicular traffic during the pandemic. And it stayed. And it's a big hit. I go there a lot. I'm an avid walker. Well, I was until I broke my kneecap. But I'm an avid walker. So I go to Old Town like three times a week because I can't afford to live there. But I walk there. So there's a contingent that's clamoring to increase this all the way up to Washington Street. I would almost argue that the block just west of what's closed is even prettier, even though it's a little farther from the water. And I talked to Jan Lambert at uh, you know, Transportation Environmental Services, and he said, well, you know, trucks can't make deliveries. He was telling me why it's so hard to progress and have more of these streets close to traffic. And if you get on Justin Wilson's Facebook page, there are a lot of people yelling that this is terrible for the city. But if you went there, you would see the vibrancy, the life, the energy. Why does it take so long for city officials to move ahead? Let me first say, since everyone here is from Alexandria, <laughs> that were Alexandria not part of Washington, D.C., it would be known as one of the great southern cities next to New Orleans, Charleston, and Savannah. I Yay, mean, one of the, it's, it's, it's true. It's a beautiful city. It kind of gets absorbed into the D.C. experience, and people don't realize what a gorgeous place it is. And King Street's fantastic. Um, I, I do like that I can speak with some credibility on uh, pedestrian closures because I'm famous for arguing against them. However, um, not against what you're proposing. I always do point out that of the 210 or so uh, streets that were pedestrianized in the 60s and 70s, about 190 of them failed. And there was a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, but the, the main lesson to be learned is, is not to not do it, but to not do what they did in the 60s and 70s, which was to expensively um, and elaborately bring in, in, in barriers and landscape and other extremely um, uh, difficult to deconstruct solutions that didn't allow them any flexibility. And what you see these days uh, in successful street reconfigurations, like Jeanette Sadekan did in Times Square, before it became permanent, is you test it, you try it out. First of all, just to put something to bed that you already know, they can make deliveries early in the day, they can make deliveries late in the day. Most of these pedestrian streets have different hours, and, and certainly for a, a popular, beautiful place, it's tougher if you've got a main street that no one likes, but for a popular, beautiful heart of a beautiful city, um, your merchants can be picky enough to say to their delivery people, these are the hours of delivery. Uh, typically early in the day, not in the middle of the day. But the, the, the most important lesson is, um, as Jeanette did in New York, you know, bring in some chairs, bring in some, she got beach chairs from Home Depot, right? Bring in some potted plants, close it temporarily, see how it goes, then close it for a whole weekend, then close it for a week, right? And then just see, see how it works. But the, the most important thing is to, um, 
when even when you make it permanent, uh, you know, have bollards potentially that can go up and down, but just have it be a generic, flexible, simple space. Do, do you guys know Downtown Crossing in Boston? Yeah. It's a very nice example. Just beautiful brickwork, bollards. Cars aren't in there, but it's a flexible space, and and ultimately, that's where Times Square went as well. Um, so I would I would say. Um, our, I mean, there, there, are, there are festivals and stuff where it is closed for a day or two already, right? Like yeah. tomorrow. But to answer your question why it's so hard, I can't, I, can't, I can't tell you how to fix your politics, but I can certainly say that that strikes me as the sort of street that would be quite successful as a permanent pedestrian axis. Is, so. is the St. Patrick's Day Parade tomorrow in uh, Alexandria? That's where you should be tomorrow, everybody, right? <coughs> oh, it was two weeks ago. Ah, oh, okay. Spoken by the person with red hair and a green and a nice green top. <laughs> I will not argue with with Lee. <laughs> um, let me quote another great friend of ours, Jeff Anderson, former head of Smart Growth America, because we're going to wrap up here in a second. He he his big selling point for Smart Growth he w was Smart Growth, get drunk and walk home. So yeah. that's why you do this. Um, let's hear it for Jeff. Everybody, thank Jeff. It's a special can, can gift to have him here. Can I interrupt? We're all here really because we support the Coalition for Smarter Growth and we will donate generously to your cause. Thank you, Jeff. Stuart. I didn't ask him to say that. Thank you. And I do especially want to thank our CSG team, including some of our friends from the Piedmont Environmental Council who are helping us tonight, like, like Marco, John Wetmore for doing video. And, um, and I want to thank the younger generation. Uh, we're ready to get out of here. I mean, we we'll live in our walkable city, but you have to go out to the suburbs so that we don't have to and you can help fix those places for us, okay? No, I'm being mean. We all grew up in the suburbs. Sonia lives in the suburbs and she's on the front lines of the battle. Get out there in Fairfax and help her and Rachel. All right, thank you all. Bye.